name is Jess Pearson, I'm the founder of the Maker Series and I'm really excited about tonight, our first masterclass, and I'm thrilled to have um, a discussion with the, a wonderful and amazing, incredible artist, Hester Berry. Hi, Hester. Hello. <laughs> so Hester is, as you all know, an extremely talented painter and life drawer. She has got uh, recognition across the country and international, massive following on social media. The Tate has commissioned her to draw and uh, write a book and she's represented by lots of different galleries around the UK. So I thought, what better way to start this masterclass series, but with Hester Berry. So we're going to get straight into it. Right, <laughs> here we go. So Hester, how did you start painting? How did you get into painting? Um, it started when I was really tiny, really. So I've always just loved painting and drawing and I remember being really tiny and colouring in you know and and then drawing painting going through school and it always being my favourite thing and the thing I you know I, I couldn't wait for art lessons and then um, as I got a bit older going to art galleries and starting to just be really attracted by various things um, and then um, going to Berlin and seeing German romantic paintings and various other things was what got me into landscape painting in particular mm. but yeah just just doing it from an early age is what got me into it yeah and um we recently did a podcast and you explained that you started selling art during whilst you were at school yes um yeah a couple of little commissions just kind of to friends and family and then um, uh, to maybe local, sm local places, cafes and things, um, small, small scale and relying on word of mouth at first and not a, not, not a lot of money, but it was just like, it, it felt rewarding being young and, and being able to do little things like that. Fantastic. How, so you started painting, how did you, create the, the painting style that you have today because it's quite a distinctive really beautiful way of capturing light and uh, landscape I find that myself like if I look at a painting even if it's quite abstract I still understand what it is how do you how did you develop that to what it is now um well I think it probably wasn't conscious it's sort of uh organic how it came about I guess so um I don't, I, don't, I don't really think, I didn't really think of a particular style. I looked at the Impressionists. I looked at, like I said, the German Romantic painters, um, uh, Turner. Very, I, I just enjoyed looking at various people. And wh when you're at school, when you're learning, it's good to copy people. When I got a bit older, I looked at some more contemporary painters. Like, um, I, I liked the painter Kurt Jackson. I looked at his work when I was... Um, when I was at school and then through my degree I looked at painters like David Tress and um, so there was all these what I did was copy paintings and when you copy your style you kind of take it on a bit and then you can accept things and carry them with you on your journey or let things go um, so I, I guess I was picking up little bits and pieces along the way and and um, I remember at the beginning of my degree I was very very tight I just wanted everything to look exactly how it was and then something happened and I wanted to go the opposite way. So I was then being really, really just flicking paint around all over the place and really freeing up and learning what happened when you attack the canvas a bit more, um, when you allow the paint to behave as it wants rather than you want. And then I guess found somewhere in the middle. Um, but then things like look, looking at the Impressionists and thinking about some of the theory that in, informed their work was was um, probably how I came to thinking about light and colour quite a lot and being objective and thinking about, you know, and the innocent eye, so how things really look without putting too much narrative or too much, um, bring it, without me bringing too much to it, if you said. Yeah, definitely. You also are an amazing life drawer. How does that impact your painting? Do they go hand in hand do you think um I've 
always well we had to do lots and lots of uh, life drawing at, at my at university in Aberystwyth it was it was quite relatively unique I think in that way at the time we had three full days of life drawing so um uh, that every week that was so I it I picked up good habits and had good tutors and I I would never show any life drawings or portraits or anything I always saw that as a way of um, I think that was about at the time when I was flicking paint around and looking at artists who really let loose and were really expressive. So I, I did see life drawing as a way of keeping some discipline um, and keeping some kind of rigor with my drawing and draftsmanship. But, but then my painting kind of, I guess, tightened a little bit and became less haphazard and a bit more deliberate. And then the life drawing perhaps loosened up and and they kind of met in the middle so that their their roles their the conversation between life drawing and painting has changed over the years i guess but um i don't know it's difficult because it's not always got to have an end it's not always got to go on a wall or be sold but it still um feeds into where i am as an artist yeah and i imagine quite a lot of the time it's kind of subconscious as well and I think as being an artist, everything is feeding into it in some way, in some form of creative way. Yeah. So how's your, how do you create a painting? What's your process from what kind of paint you use? Do you go out on walks? Do you, uh, ha what, how's your, what is your process of making a painting? Um, so I think, yeah, I'll go out on lots of walks. I'll, I'll take my, I'll often take my sketchbook with me I'll try I'll always aim to take my sketchbook and um either just a biro if I'm lucky and I feel like I'm gonna have leisure to stop and paint I might take some watercolors otherwise maybe a pen or even a biro you know some, some I've got some nice um brush tip pens that I like to work with or a biro um and, and my phone just take photos on and just do as much just take gather source material without really thinking about what's going to make a good painting just what jumps out um and eventually uh if i don't have if i don't have a sketchbook with me what i'll do is either draw a quick photo uh, use a little app on my phone to do a quick sketch or even just kind of draw something on my hand using my finger which sounds really weird but it's just a way of absorbing so you don't end up with anything, but you've looked and you've gone through the same process as if you're going to do a quick sketch. So I've got, um, I've got the, the kind of, the spirit of the of the experience. You know, I've got all sides of it, not just the visual, with me and rooted a bit more strongly. Plus, I've got the photo. The photo is what I will work from. So even if I've done a nice drawing of the place, I won't refer to it when I'm painting, because. Well, I, I kind of don't need it after I've done it. Um, but the, I'll, I'll, when I come home, I'll go through my phone and see what jumps out still. Um, and I use photos as, I've kind of gone forwards and backwards with whether I think photos are a good idea or not to work from. And at the moment, what I'm really interested in is, is colour and light and how close I can get them to real because then I can let form go. So I'm working from photos they kept small um so i don't get sucked into detail but i'll i'll um i'll have my phone there and i'll i've got a load of boards already primed and then with a a brown neutral ground on so i'll i'll choose the image i'm going to make i'll choose the size of board i'm going to use um i don't work on canvas very often anymore because i like the rigidity of board and i like to be able to scratch it and um uh the, the the surface of flat wood just suits me better than the give of canvas so I've got my board I've got my source material and um, I'm, I use oil paints so uh, I did I used to paint on really dodgy substrates that I thought were a bit more <laughs> eco-friendly so like recycled cardboard and sometimes paper mache I did I remember making some paper mache including like bits of old rubbish or um, plastic bags into it as a way of reclaiming that stuff, upcycling, it, I guess, and not letting it go into the environment. But now I'm a bit more careful with what I use because it seems 
less sustainable if it doesn't last more than you know if it doesn't last that long I need to be a bit more sure of how it's going to survive so I, I use reasonable quality paints and oil paints and um, reasonable quality boards and probably quite cheap brushes and knives <laughs> uh, and I use quite thick brushes so that I can work quickly um, and economically without without getting too fiddly you know so I, I yeah I like that yeah I, I you can tell that from your work how so you're out you're looking in a landscape how do you choose a landscape well I I don't really I don't I don't I, well I choose it but I don't have anything that helps I don't consciously have anything that helps me make the decision but I know that I'm drawn to various things and sometimes I'll, I'll paint something that I'm not used to doing because it's jumped out at me the basic rule is if it speaks to me somehow and I don't have to justify it to myself it's just if I feel like it's going to work I'll try it um, but often what I feel is going to work is the same as what landscape painters over the centuries have have also fallen on which is there's there's various things in landscapes that are interest interestingly seem to speak to people like water um the the depth of field so whether you have like something framing you you know like foliage or something in the foreground a long view in the distance um maybe some kind of evidence of other human activity but not too much so all these things that make us as a viewer or as an animal feel comfortable like you know water and space and and territory those things are often present but i know that i don't choose them they they just kind of often fall into that formula you used to live in brighton how how has landscape changed has it changed coming back to north devon for you in your paintings Oh, well, I guess the subject matter has changed, but I mean, I've, I always came back to Devon to visit family. So I, I would normally go back to Brighton armed with loads of um, photos to paint from. And then by the time I would run out, I'd have to go off into the South Downs or somewhere, or maybe I'd be going somewhere one weekend or one week. Um, and it, I, I did find it harder to find subject matter in the South East, but not impossible there's interesting things that that came out um so it's not i don't think the subject matter has changed too much but the output has so i'm doing a lot more i've got more space to work for a start but also just found a lot more inspiration down here so had a lot more i wanted to paint do you have a favorite walk that you go on and get inspiration from no because as soon as it starts to be a favorite it kind of then I get bored of it I think my favorite walk is a new one um yeah I I like to I, at the moment in lockdown I've, I'm limited and there's a few walks I can do I'm lucky because there are a few different walks and they're all lovely but I have I can't do them three days two or three days in a row I have to vary them so I think as long as it's new or slightly um, no, not new, because I do the same things a lot. But as long as I haven't been there for a while, I guess I like to see how it changes, you know, how, how the mm. seasons happen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Di in different lights and different weathers. And and you've got a dog, so you have to go out in all weathers, don't you? <laughs> because sometimes um, I've... I mean, often... It's not sunshine... Well, yeah, often strong sunlight works really well for painting, but um, but sometimes, surprisingly, a really dreary day works well. And I, w I may not have discovered that if I didn't have to go out and walk the dog. So, yeah, it's useful. And it's useful having, like, company. <laughs> 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 Definitely. Drawing with. So you've created this beautiful style of working and... How did you start to engage your audience in all sorts of different ways from 
let's start with um, social media. How did you start building that? Um, I, I've never really thought, I mean, I did it, but I never really thought of it too hard. I just sort of did it. I mean, I realised that Facebook was going to be, well, I was on, I, I can't remember when Facebook started, but I, I tried to not go on Facebook. I guess I was at uni, so I was in my early 20s. I tried not to join it, and then I realised everyone was on it. <laughs> it's how people were connecting, so I did go on it. And then I realised I could share my work through it and just get it to a slightly wider audience. And because this was I don't, second my second year at university, um, that's probably the time I wanted to be growing my audience. So that was really useful, putting paintings on online. Um, and, um, and then... Oh, and a website as well. So learning how to have a website and share the details and then learning about mailing lists and th things um, and building networks. So go finishing my degree and having all my friends and contacts from my degree and then moving on and galleries that I knew in Wales and then moving to Wimbledon and meeting a new, a new group and new galleries and networking, I guess, online, but also in real life and getting these contacts um and but we i guess with social media you rely on it spreading you rely on people sharing things and um that that was helpful i think i'm quite lucky the sorts of paintings i do are they're they're colorful and because they ha because i use big brush marks they work as like little images they're not too fiddly so that if you see them as a little thumbnail they don't disappear they still work so um they they I, I guess they're relatively eye-catching on social media and just that simple crude thing helps quite a lot I found I think it's it's sometimes really unfair because I know like brilliant musicians who struggle because they haven't got image-based things to share um, or other artists whose work just doesn't translate quite so well on a screen or as a small you know thumbnail so I'm at a slightly unfair advantage, I think. <laughs> well, and your work is incredible as well. So let's not like <laughs> breeze past that. <laughs> so have you got any tips or do you have a marketing strategy? Do you have a social media plan? Is there like, what, what, what do you hashtag kind of, what do you do? Anything? <laughs> I don't have a plan. Um, and I don't, um, I think this is another reason I feel kind of very lucky because I, I've never thought of that. I've never thought of planning my social media. I've never thought about what time I pay. There's a whole science behind social media. Um, recently I got onto, well, not recently, four or five years ago, I got onto Instagram as well. And that's been really useful because it's, it's image-based. It's more image-based and simple than Facebook. So it's, um, that's really helped me. And as soon as you start growing, it's sort of, it's easier. You like, if things get shared a bit, if you've got a bigger audience, they get shared more and more and it's, it, it grows exponentially. But I've never really thought too much about it. I think I only, it took me quite a long time to work out what hashtags were and how you mm -hmm. use them and what the at sign does and all of these things. And when I did, I, I sort of, I realized that if you tag people, I think what I don't like is to be like annoying and self well I don't like to be too self-promoting I don't like there's something if I feel uncomfortable about doing something I'd rather miss out well to a degree I'm, I'm more likely to miss out on something than to really push myself and flaunt myself and um because it, it feels awkward and I know a lot of people have that problem with self-promotion um so I didn't I didn't do it too much. If I was going to tag anybody, it would be somebody completely relevant to the post who probably knew or expected to be tagged. Um, I wouldn't go and do like, I don't know, tag hundreds of people just to spread it. Um, and with the hashtags, they're kind of, I think I, I learned what they were and thought, oh, let's try this. And um, how did I start? I think I started by just putting something that seemed general enough that if somebody that, that somebody was quite likely to search that hashtag and that's how it might come up um and and yeah it's just it, it seemed to me 
common sense things, but I've since learned various little tricks. I find I find talking about hashtags and things a little bit like icky, if you know what I mean. A bit yeah. like, like it puts my teeth <laughs> on edge a bit, but it has been really helpful, and I'm sure it has grown my following. And again, that sounds a bit, I don't know, un unartistic talking about your following somehow but then that has allowed me to do various things that I do find artistic and meet yeah. people so it's all like a means to an end but so speaking about the means and the hashtags and things um there's various things I learned how to do like I could put I don't know how much detail you want me to go into but <laughs> putting little dots and then going down so yeah. all the hashtags yeah. are hidden yes. away from your post so it doesn't yeah. look like you've gone hashtag, 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 even if you have, they're kind of hidden out of the way. And little tricks like that for making me feel a bit more comfortable. Sure. Doing it all. My domain is like the splashing paint on rather than the, the managing the the business or the media side of it so finding sensible and effective ways to do it is it just sort of I can do it and then forget about it I think whenever you approach anybody unsolicited, it's got to be as you've got to keep in mind. Well, I always think, how would I feel if I was being approached unsolicited? So you have to keep that in mind. You have to, I think, I mean, there are stories of famous artists being really annoying until they got what they wanted and that's how they got famous. But in general, and as a rule, I think what you need to do is be as not as not annoying as possible and as as succinct and simple as possible and make life easy so what I would do is I wouldn't um if I was going to send a letter to a gallery I uh, I I'm, like when I was first doing this it was a lot of galleries would, would accept things from you know from through the actual post rather than email so um you could send a short covering letter short simple covering letter with a cv that is has the most relevant and important and impressive things on it so maybe where you've shown before um or your education or anything that you think might put you in better stead but not too you know not too long just the most important things um so a covering letter a cv and the work itself and i just think the best way because people galleries are going to be getting hundreds of letters or emails they want to be able to go nah, or interesting maybe pile so I would put um if I was sending something through the post I would have a photo a printed photo one or two printed photos maybe a cd one but I feel like there's no point in putting a seat just a cd and no image anywhere else because if a busy gallery owner gets that and they're like oh I'll, I'll put that in the computer later they're unlikely to be like Ooh, I'll just go and turn my computer on and put this in. It's got to be really, really easy all the time. So with emails as well, just simple, your, a couple, not loads, a couple of your most striking paintings um, and similarly a CV, what you've done to date. Everything's simple and easy and accessible, I think. Good advice. Uh, so you've just mentioned something and I just thought, oh, we'll go back to that. You talked about photographing. How do you photograph your art? Because actually your photos of your art are very good, um, as everyone can see on your Instagram. So how has that process been for you? And what have you concluded is the best way to take photographs of your art? Um, well, where I, I, you, uh, but, well, uh, Aberyst with and at Wimbledon. So on both my degree and my master's course, I had some um, lessons in photographing 
my work and there's there's quite a lot of technical things that you should do and things to make it easier and various things um to make it clear and there's certain rules like whatever you take it on there's certain rules like crop it carefully don't have messy bits don't have it at an angle try to reduce it's, it's quite difficult to reduce glare with oil paintings but keep mm. the glare to a, a minimum try and get the light as, and the color as accurate as possible um, and doing it on a, a digital camera with digital is best because then you can transfer things quickly to file um, doing it on something where you can adjust the aperture and shutter speed and everything is how I was taught to do it but <laughs> the big but well I that's what I've always tried to do and I've always like I've I carried my paintings outside I waited till there was a sort of overcast but not too dark and not raining day carried everything outside set up a tripod because you want to like leave the shutter speed for 10 seconds so there's no vibrations anywhere near the painting or the camera um, so it's on a tripod and I, I got some quite good photos like that, but because it was outside, because the light was best outside, quite often they would blow over in the wind. Oh no. <laughs> and then I, a few years ago I bought, oh, I had quite a good camera that was just quite easy to use and it just seemed to produce good results. And then that got old and died. So I bought a new one and I, I spent hours and days researching the best camera that I could reasonably afford um, and and then got advice and then I realized I needed to buy some lights because it wasn't quite good enough and then I it still was tricky I went and I, I spoke to lots of people got help from people um, and spent quite a lot of money and time and then I I actually dropped my phone down the loo so I had to buy a new one <laughs> just a like a second hand one and it it's got quite a good camera on it and I quickly realized that just pointing, not even on a tripod, just pointing and clicking with this phone is better than any of the lights and expensive <laughs> camera and anything that I got, which, which is fine. But um, I, I've recently looked into printing. I mean, it's fine for having things on a screen. I've recently looked into printing and I, I may need to revisit the idea of taking quick photos on my phone. But the point is technology is especially phones have come on so quickly that a lot of people have said it's like the best way they can photograph work is to take a quick photo on their phone so that's how we do it at the moment anyway it's pretty immediate as well because especially going onto instagram it's a lot easier isn't it to like just get the photo edit it a little bit maybe and then just put it up you've got natural lights haven't you you've got like natural lights in your studio yeah and I guess that's important for painting but also photography that throughout the day you can kind of control that to a certain extent yeah um yeah it's, so you need like a white light for painting really because then because if you paint in a warm yellow light like you might have in any room in your house your painting will look You'll, you'll do your best to make your painting look as you want it and then you take it into daylight mm. or you change the light color and it will suddenly look really cold so yeah you, it, my studio's got white lights in it daylight flavored yeah. lights anyway <laughs> um we'll go just sorry i'm flipping over round and around and about but i just wanted to quickly go back to how you work with galleries um we've talked to, obviously you've talked about how you approach them how do you work with them so you're obviously based in North Devon and you're sending work or traveling with work how are you how are you working that um I did used to travel anywhere that I needed to send work to because it felt it felt too scary posting it um so I would go and I I mean a lot of the time that I've been selling work, I was um, in the southeast, which was a bit, it was a bit easier to reach most of the places that I was exhibiting. So I'd drive a couple of hours. Um, but then, yeah, coming back to Devon, 
it's not it's not as pos it's not quite as useful i mean i still like the opportunity to go and deliver a painting and just get, go somewhere different if i can but actually um i do actually just send some things in the royal mail like i'll i'll insure it and track it and, and things and wrap it like it's got to be bomb proof before you let it yeah. go but actually couriering things is not quite that always seems something quite sounds silly but it sounded kind of scary and something I would you like proper artists did but actually it's not that it's not that expensive especially if you're sending a big body of work like a few paintings at a time um so yeah quite often I'll courier things to them um there's a few galleries there's one gallery I work there's a couple of galleries I work with a lot that I've only ever been to once or twice and I've met the my contacts I feel like I'm really close to some of them and then I realize I've met them once for five minutes <laughs> um, so yeah you don't always have to have the, the physical contact with them well we have the internet so that's kind of yeah <laughs> I want to move on to how you got into teaching and also after we've spoken about that, how you teach now, because obviously it's changed dramatically since uh, the dreaded C word. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to mention it. Um, so yeah, if we could talk a bit about your teaching and because you're an amazing teacher and with working with you, uh, we did a little film together uh, makers in isolation I got to see lovely people um, drawing with you so I just thought it looked wonderful so how do you teach how did you get into teaching and then I'll ask a few more questions about that after you've answered <laughs> I I have no no teacher training or anything so I started off very small and very like what did I do I think I did some some classes in a I just volunteered in a community centre um just doing simple crafty arty classes and then um and I did various things like that and then I was helping teach a kids art group and then um I I got I, I met um draw in Brighton and there and I actually I think I was I got on well with the guy who runs it Jake Spicer and was I don't know why he allowed me to do this actually, but he um, just allowed me to teach a little bit. I think we'd had conversations and we'd seen each other's work and he allowed me to teach. So that was how I really got into it because he, I, mean, I was just very lucky. He's got, uh, Draw has a huge following and he's worked very hard to build it up. It's a very grassroots kind of studio. So I, I was lucky to get um, a kind of, a bit of informal teaching with a little bit of money um, actually, no, I started off for free with him because I, it gave me some life drawing time. That's how it started off. And then as draw grew more, um, I got paid a little bit for it. And then through word of mouth, got offered other teaching jobs. Um, and yeah, it, it, all ever, it, it all grew slowly and from very little. Um, and, and the way I teach is just like I said I've got no teacher training so I don't know if I'm teaching how I should be or in 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 good ways in ways that in a sort of accepted ways I've always just thought about how I work how per I personally work and just tried to deliver that um in a sensible way in a an accessible way um and it seems to have worked. Uh, I've, I, yeah, I've not really thought about teaching methods so much. I've just tried to think of sensible ways of explaining how I do what I do, which means also because there are so many different ways of working. I do have to say, this is just what I do. You know, there are other ways of doing it as well, rather than doing like a general, a general thing. But... So how has it changed? Obviously, it's changed quite a lot. And how did you manage that? Because even this time last year, you were actually teaching with people, weren't you? Um, it's been, it's less, yeah, January. So it would have been January, February, perhaps you're still teaching 
physically in a group and then had to move to the wonderful world of Zoom. How do you, how have you found it? What have you learned? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, um, I've been teaching, so I did a lot of life drawing teaching in Brighton, but when I moved to Devon, I got, um, I inherited a portrait class, actually. I was really lucky. Someone was leaving, so I took on a portrait class in the White Moose Gallery. And then that that sort of carried on. And even after the White Moose closed, I kept that portrait group. And that was going on every week um, in Barnstaple in North Devon. And um, I had a, a lovely relatively loyal core of people that came every week and then a few um that a a few new people um you know it's all very dropping so it was um it was a, a kind of changing group but then when because it's it was on a tuesday afternoon it it was there was a lot of um older drawers and retired drawers less less of a kind of younger uh, client base I guess you'd say so quite quickly when coronavirus was growing quite quickly people said that they were uncomfortable um because a lot of people would have been in you know an at, at risk groups so I had to think how I was going to do it quite quickly and obviously we we didn't know then how long it was going to be around for but I did think it was going to be a while like a few months so I tried I had to I had to think how I might do it I wanted to just have some sort of presence and I didn't think it would be that I didn't think I thought it would just be a bit cobbled together but just some kind of contact with people and so I tried different platforms I tried different ways of doing it online and asked a few questions you know asked different people who had done similar things or not similar things, but, you know, worked online more. And actually there was a group, there's a group called Mothers Who Make that I'm involved with. They're they're kind of like a support network and um, a really great um, group for mothers who make anything. So musicians and, and they, they moved on to Zoom quite quickly. So I heard about Zoom through them and they, they did one of their meetings that way and I realized how useful that would be just the way it's all set up how how it would be possible to do classes through that and because it's quite it's relatively easy you don't need an account or anything it's relatively easy to set up a class and it's quite user-friendly and everything so I tried a few of them I had a few tester sessions and then it's just done quite well it's just as everybody knows and everybody has learned over the past year it's just convenient and there have been teething problems and then there have been new things I've learned and and then there's all the other issues like how do you tell people about it how do you get the links out how do you promote it how do you um how do you monetize it so there's been lots of learning curves with it and we were speaking yesterday about because I was uh, asking you lots of questions about zoom because <laughs> i'm learning too but you were saying how you've been doing a few classes where you've had multiple videos going on yeah that's a that's a recent thing i got so i was doing landscape demonstrations when i do the portrait classes i have um it's it's i'm, I'm sitting here like this and i'm drawing in my sketchbook and it's all very crude even even like a year on i haven't really up to up to the tech at all i do my draw oops, i drew my do my drawing and then i hold my book up quite often throw it on the floor like that hold my book up and show people a drawing that's not my drawing by the way that's um, um an old painting i can't pretend i did that <laughs> hold it up and just sh- and tell people my steps so it's a very low tech way of doing it when i do painting demonstrations I'll, it'll be like this with, with the camera on a painting and I'll just be kind of moving out of the way so people can see it. <laughs> and then um, I was supposed to be doing some teaching with a studio and it, it obviously got cancelled. So we thought, is there any other... Well, I, I said I was doing some online ones and asked if they wanted to put some on for me so we could keep something going. And he uh so that's the phoenix studio in tower and the guy james who runs that he's really pushed me to up my game a bit 
So he watched the way I did it and it was fine, but it wasn't quite polished. It wasn't very polished. It's still not very, very polished, but he, he really pushed me to improve it a bit. So he encouraged me, he, well, he set up a meeting with someone who knows what they're doing with Zoom art classes. And we looked at different cameras, different technologies, microphones, and there's a, there's a useful program that we got so you could have like the photo. So I was emailing everyone the photo and saying, you'll have to find some way of looking at the photo and me at the same time. But now I've worked out how to get um, the, the, a little image of the photo here, a photo of me painting here and a, a sorry, not a photo, a video here and then a video of something else here. So all on one screen, it just, it's a bit, it looks a bit more professional, I think. And what's that software? Just so if anyone wants to know. OBS, but I can't remember what that stands for. Okay, well, Google or other browsers, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. <laughs> but yeah, it's surely been uh, quite a learning curve, but obviously doing extremely well. I want to know, you're such a prolific artist. Like every single day, I feel like you're putting up new work. How do you manage like life to work or art uh, balance? Also, you're a, a mother of two gorgeous boys, little boys. How do you balance it all? How are you, you're like superwoman. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm lucky that my um, husband is a musician. So he's not like, he's not out every day. He's not working like a, a like a nine to five sort of job. Sure. We, um, I'm also lucky that my paintings happen very quickly. So there's that, that's mm. why I'm prolific. So I'm not kind of working on one painting for six months. Um, he, so I, the way we work would be in the evening to say, who's going to work tomorrow? Um, who's going to look after the baby? Um, and just decide, and it's, it's roughly on, off, on, off. But then if somebody's got a lot more work on, then, you know, it, we, it's quite organic and we just, we just see whose need is greater at the time. So I'm lucky that I've got the, I've got the support I need. Otherwise I do work. I mean, before coronavirus, when he would be away a lot playing music, um, I would work late into the evenings and just be a bit tired um it's quite nice including the kids if i can so i would not let them up here when i'm doing an oil painting but going out and sketching with them has been finding ways of getting finding ways of allowing things to happen is useful so having i mean i've put on a few life drawing classes where children are welcome and that's kind of the point and the model has been really brilliant and so the, I, I did a couple of things in Brighton and in Devon, actually, where there'd be, it would be a normal life drawing class, but there'd be a rug and some toys in the middle. So <laughs> you've got all the, the drawers around the outside and then the model over there and then all the children in the middle. Um, so just finding any way, however imperfect, of getting on with it, I guess even if it's limiting sometimes the limitations are really useful actually so sometimes the time constraints are, are useful and they've helped me actually develop my work quite a lot so just always finding a finding a way around things or through things or including the children I've got quite a lot of pages in my sketchbook that are collaborations where I've got a reasonable drawing in black and gray pen with bright colored crayon in it, right. and on it and all over it <laughs> that's wonderful <laughs> do you frame them i would <laughs> there'll be there'll be thousands of pounds when <laughs> that's really lovely and i was yeah i was going to say having children must focus you um and make sure you use every uh minute possible you know and it kind of hones you in I remember before I had children just thinking, why am I not painting? What am I doing? Like I'm faffing around so much. And now I, I do a lot more. Like I wish I had more time, always wish I had more time, but I still do more than I did before I had children. 
and there's all I mean I don't know if anybody in anybody watching has kids and finds it difficult with the mothers who make group that I go to the the biggest complaint is time that's everyone has that issue um and I mean even if you don't have children life gets in the way and time is always one of the main problems um so I think it, sometimes it's a case of not always having to do a finished painting sometimes it's just being able to make marks on a piece of paper so doing some sketching or or getting out and doing some drawing or making something that's re that's actually really valuable I see a lot of I, I get a lot from that so making imperfect things that aren't meant to last but just the act of making whether somebody else is helping me <laughs> or not <laughs> do you uh how two questions first question how quick do you take how long does it take to do a painting because you said it takes you very not very much time I'm really intrigued in how long it takes you um it it does vary I don't like a painting to last more than a day because it it feels like it's that I, I don't know I've got the I'm in the mood for it and it, if it goes overnight I'm not in the same frame of mind so I don't like it to take too long if it's big if it's um yeah if it's big it might have to but a small one um a sm like something this sort of size 20 by 20 centimeters is a format I work on quite a lot um that's a good size to take out and do plein air painting and if i'm do if i'm working outside really a couple of hours is probably all you've got before the light changes too much um although having said that the challenge of the light changing is interesting and it gets it it becomes not a snapshot it becomes a a chunk of time so but anyway still you you, you can't you don't want it to last too long if you're outside and i've brought that um that kind of approach into the studio where I have more time um but I, I still like that language of painting and the economy I think from have, when the kids were young when my children were young I had to be quick then so for example when when my first child was like a week old I was breastfeeding so I, ha I I couldn't devote hours and hours at a time so I had to find ways of economizing and actually that that's really pushed me on and um so I, I realized that I could do a painting within a couple of hours and then I spent a long time honing that and working out how I could be economical and very focused and getting not just a quick scruffy painting but exactly what I wanted but as streamlined as possible you know wasting no marks um now they're less dependent they're a bit older I'm not needed quite as much I've got to try to retain that urgency because now it takes longer to do a painting and I'll I'll work I mean it might look all right after an hour and a half and then I'll I'll be laboring for three hours and then right at the end, I'll have to, I'll have to I'll put some big marks to obscure lots of it and take it back to how it was in the first couple of hours. So, yeah, between between like two hours and a day, I guess, depending on the size. And how do you know when you finish? Like, I know that's quite a perhaps a cliche question, but how how do you do you stand back and how, what tells you that it's finished? Um. Either someone shouting me to come to, to come downstairs, or um, actually, that that sounds silly, but often that is it. Like I've got a time limit. I, I roughly knew the time limit when I started, and um, having having to go away from it. When I come back, I realise that it is finished, and that will do. And actually, if I can realise that before I'm pushed into it that's the trick I think so um or when you realize you're not actually adding anything when it all gets frustrating and you realize you're not adding anything none of the marks are doing anything um I tend to 
when the board starts to be filled up with color and there's fewer spaces, I slow down with my marks anyway. I've trained myself to, st to slow down and do each mark individually and get distance. So I'm constantly going forwards and backwards from the painting, um, making myself pause and look back at it so that I can see a bit more objectively whether it, it is done. I don't know. Done is a bit of a weird way. Whether I'll ruin it if I do any more is more the <laughs> issue, I think. Yeah. I, I've always found in with my work and with my film work, that's time away, even if it's short, even if it's a moment, can be as helpful as slogging away at it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's interesting though, because then time away is still part of the painting. A valuable part of the painting and time looking and all the lead up to it so it's I mean although the painting doesn't take very long to actually do there's a lot of time kind of preparing yourself to do it and um and then all the the gathering source material before it and and also any painting that's led up to it that informs it so each painting should be a develop a development on what's come before so yeah it's it's a full journey and everything feeds into each other, I imagine. Like you just said. If you don't want to like stop and be complacent and be satisfied with where you are. <laughs> Never. Content. No, no. <laughs> we struggle. <laughs> we're, we're meant to be struggling. No, no. The last question I have before we open up to our other questions is... Do you have any kind of inspiring books you recently read or websites or apps or groups or podcasts that you listen to that are about art or about professional practice or? Um, I, I did like, there were some podcasts put on by the Royal Academy, but they, I haven't seen any for, I think they, they slowed down before coronavirus, actually. So I don't think it's coronavirus's fault. But they were quite useful. There was a lot of in conversations um, with artists. And they were useful because they're not just about the art. They're also about career. So there was, there was a really great one with Maggie Hambling. Um, that's always fun because she's such a <laughs> force. I like them because, I mean, and not just painters, not just people that are relevant you know, artists that are rele immediately relevant to my practice. It's really interesting hearing how musicians and writers and poets and just different artists, filmmakers and directors and how, how they work and how they, um, how they live. Actually, there was, a, there was a series on the BBC, I think, What Do Artists Do All Day? That I found really inspiring as well. Um, because you see all the bits in between the making work, all the, you know, like making a bit of food or going out and <laughs> thinking about things. There's a lot of thinking that needs to be done. And actually that's the bit that's sometimes more difficult, the space to think. But um, um, the, the, the book that informs my work most is probably this one, Landscape. Landscape and Western Art by Malcolm Andrews is a really useful book for landscape and it really covers a lot. You can see that there's, um, um, well, there's land, land art. It's not just, you know, can, it's not just traditional paintings. There's a lot that just feeds into the whole idea of landscape. So that's really useful. Um, and Instagram actually is hmm great and just sort of following people that inspire you and not trying to focus on people who are too much like you but people you just artists you just um I don't know admire for their work ethic or the way they live or the way they get on with things um actually Kurt Jackson's sketchbooks are really great I would recommend having a look at them um because they I've sort of maybe fallen out with his painting fallen out of love with his paintings but his sketchbooks just continue to really inspire me because they they are evidence of him always making marks and sometimes making beautiful detailed paintings and drawings sometimes just 
there's there's little sketches of loaves of bread or family members and things just around him and i love the idea of your diet your sketchbook being a, a diary um and that's that really has pushed me to make more marks just make marks all the time which is really useful fantastic right i'm going to open it up to i've uh, i've been seeing a few people have added a few questions in so i'm gonna change it to gallery hello everyone i can see some of you so right okay so i had a question about um can people join your live classes hester yes um that, so my portrait classes there's links to my online classes on my website. Um, so, yeah, you can, there's, they're, they are bookable in various different places, but, but yeah, mostly um, they should all be on my website. And um, if not, then you can always just ping me a message and I can tell you where or how to book them and... Um, yeah great the, uh, the next question i've got is what phone do you have <laughs> yeah it's a google pixel they i think google pixel have quite good cameras on them the only problem is when you do have a good camera it also has a good screen which is interesting because that's that's sometimes a problem so i see the photos that i take on my phone beautifully but i'll send them to somebody else and they might not so i have to be careful when i photograph my work that if the, the, if the saturation goes down a little bit, like the saturation might go down on another device. So I have to be careful that it's as bright as possible so that the, so that it's not lost when other people, I've, I've, I've done a couple of demos where the person who's putting on the demo said, can you send me the photo you're going to be working from? So I have, and they're like, oh, that's really dark because it's come out differently on their device. So google pixel they do tend to be good cameras i think they work pretty well but you just it, yeah i think also when you're sending stuff uh you have to really think about how it's de downgraded so i know whatsapp does downgrade images quite a lot even we transfer yeah okay. well it does to film at least um i don't know about photos but it does with film certainly downgrade we transfer does um, oh, I didn't know it that. does, yeah. So I think it's if they're too big of files, they tend to downgrade. So you have to always think about that. It's always a tough one with colour, because obviously I come up against that, being a filmmaker. And I know that you can go through lots of calibration stuff. Carolina probably knows about this. Um, <laughs> calibration of the screen, etc. But you can't control what other people's screens are like. That's just not something that you can do. So you just have to do the best you can and hope that they've got a decent screen and, you know. I get this a lot. This is a big problem with my demos, actually, at the moment, the the, the colour um, and the way round it I get. I mean, some people say it's fine and some people have big problems with it. Some people say, well, it could be a bit better. So, yes, yeah, screen, people's screens are one issue. But the other thing is, I guess, if you're doing it, if, you're, if, I'm, if I'm photographing work, um, I, I need to get as close as possible, but I'm always careful that what people see isn't better or more vibrant or warmer than the real thing, because the worst thing you want is for someone to see a, an image, buy it without having seen it in the flesh and it to arrive and be insipid compared to the image they've got. So you have to think about that. But um, when uh, if you're working on screen, I guess the best thing is to um, just to say, like, I'm... I'm training i'm teaching people how to see and mix colors rather than to focus too much on the colors i'm using because mm -hmm. they just don't come across but i think if you look at um if you google a famous painting any famous painting they'll all come up on on the screen on the search um lots of lots of versions of the same image will come up on the, the search and they'll all be really different colors so it's not just it's not just people like me who photograph their own work badly it's a <laughs> universal issue sure yeah um i'm just going to say uh, people are writing here that you're more than welcome 
to to turn your un, or turn your mic on and ask the question directly to Hester. I'm more than happy for that to happen. Um, I'll just say a few other things and I'll let people talk if they want. Um, OBS, Matt says OBS means open broadcasting software. So there you go. And Jean has said that, um, I think it's Talking with Painters um, is a podcast, which is great. Um, yeah. And then I know Stella's asked a question. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to go through them. There's so many. <laughs> okay can you talk about how you went about designing your website and do you do you update it regularly I've never designed my own website because I don't think I'm very good at designing things like I understand there's certain things I've learned like um that things need to be simple but I, I don't like the idea of I, I think about what I like in a website I don't like it when you have to scroll down like to see all the different parts of a website so I like my website to be on one screen if possible unless you're going through like an archive then I don't mind scrolling down but um I so uh, there's a few things that I want from my website but I've never really designed it I've always left that up to someone who knows what they're doing um I and also I'm terrible at tech stuff so until recently I've not um designed or made or updated my website I would wait six months and then get somebody to do it but my friend Chris Hatton has just made my website re recently, I think recently, no, like a couple of years ago, probably because of coronavirus. I think a couple of years has gone by. But anyway, <laughs> um, he, he's set it up for me beautifully. He's sort of, he's designed it. He's listened to what I wanted, but he set it up for me so that I now being the most useless person at website stuff ever can update it roughly i can't do big structural changes but i can write stuff and put pictures in which is yeah he's good at that chris he yeah i've built i pretty much built all of my websites with chris and just learning and then skyping him and asking him loads of questions and then learning and there's something um if you can get a web designer that helps you learn that's really um empowering i would say to be able to control your own site Say that again, Hester. It looks good and what is user friendly as well, which often we don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, we don't have the background knowledge to, and we're not looking at websites and making them constantly. So, yeah, it's definitely good to have an expertise, uh, an eye of an expertise. So, um, I'm going to put a few people on the spot now. If there's a, just silence, I will say it for you. But I was wondering, Stella has asked a question. Stella, do you want to um, ask it in person? I just wanted to ask, Hester's painting has got sparser and just real mark making. Where will she take this in the future? I don't, I don't know. I think it's got less sparse. I'm getting kind of... I'm getting worried that it's getting fussier now because I've got more time. I've got less less needy children. It, I feel like I've got more time and my paintings are getting a bit fussier now. So I think I'm still at a struggle with trying to keep it sparse. But I don't know. It's in, I don't I don't know. It's, it was one painting at a time and see where it goes, I think. Um it be I would like it to get even sparser and become more abstract. Well, you're certainly on the way to that, and it will be an interesting road, I think. Yeah, it's a struggle to try to keep it economic, I think. But that's what I'm trying to do, and then that might give me more ideas. Yeah. Watch this space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to... Oh, sorry, did you want to say more, Stella? Just, just thank you, really. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. I'm going to say people's names because I feel like it's a bit nicer if they ask questions. But if you really don't want to, I'll take the silence and I'll um, ask, ask them for you. We've got Stacey Black with a question. I don't know if you want to come online, Stacey, with your... No? Okay, that's absolutely fine. So I'm going to ask you, what was the name of the sketchbook artist? That was, was it? Kurt Jackson. Kurt, Kurt Jackson. Jackson. Cool. cool. Um, we've already asked one from Sue Ross. I say John Virtue as well, though. John Virtue's got yeah. lovely sketchbooks in a different way, but he went on walks every day and would um, and would just make marks that were just these beautiful responses to landscape. So, 
John Virtue as well. Fantastic. We've got a question from Mark. I don't know if you want to come online, Mark. Hi, Jess. Yeah. Hi. Hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Hester, if I'm presuming you take commissions, um, I'm wondering, does that restrict you in any sense and in, in, in restrict your creativity if you, if you get a commission in terms of what you do and how you paint? Sometimes, but it's interesting because I think most, most of the time limitations are interesting and and help you grow in various ways. So if, if I get a commission to do a portrait of somebody I don't know, that's that there's it's it's a lot of pressure well whatever the commission is is a lot of pressure and sometimes the pressure is good and it just depends it's always different sometimes it's like a, a straight a brief that I've, i'm not used to and I, i've got to try and rethink things and that's actually great and really valuable sometimes the commission is something like do do what you do and yeah that's it there's there's very little brief like do the sort of landscape you quite often do but give it to me <laughs> and sometimes it's like can you do my house but can you do it like this can you do it and they're sometimes they're the trickier so actually sometimes they work out surprisingly well and are, are, are challenging enough to be fun um but I think it's I think it's um, is yeah different I think that maybe requests for changes afterwards sometimes they push me into being a little bit more um strict with myself sometimes i think um this it's a bit stifling but i i just have to you just have to think about it in different ways like i'm not um i'm not established and wealthy enough to to say no to, well i mean you know sometimes it's 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 just income and you just have to happily go with what people want so it really de depends i guess i think i always re i always like a challenge so when it does feel challenging i tend to see it more as that a, a challenge and an opportunity to grow than something too stifling okay thank you i would say you've also got quite a mix like you you're not just doing commission work you're doing a lot of landscapes in between and i imagine that helps yeah, it's, all, it's a good, very diet. <laughs> right, we're going to go to Carolina with your question, if you're happy to turn your audio on. I think I did. Perfect. Right. Um, I was interested if Hester uses any mixing mediums, because um, there's been quite a lot of talk. Well, I listen to podcasts as well, and there's an artist, landscape artist called Andrew Tischler on YouTube. And he does some very interesting podcasts. And he made an interview with a guy called um, uh, Virgil Elliot. Uh, he's issued a book on archival properties of oil paintings. And he's quite big on, on lead white on the paint. So I wondered if, if Hester uses I lead never, white at all. No, I've never it? used it. Um, oh, you've heard of it, yeah. No, I've, I, I'm, I used to paint like w with like I just you know was really incautious about everything and then when I had kids I just became more nervous about things yeah, and yeah. I've got somebody gave I think I put all my I had a couple of cadmiums and a couple of nasty things and they've been in a plastic in, in lots of plastic bags with elastic bands around them in a cupboard for years now and I still don't really want to take them out because I do I'm, I wear gloves I keep the door to my studio locked no one comes in here but I still find paint in surprising places. So I'm care I, d I don't want to risk it. And I don't, I don't feel like I need it. I use titanium white and yeah. I've never f felt the, I mean, I guess I've never tried lead white, so I don't know what I'm missing, but I've never felt um, that I need to, I can normally get away without using the toxic, versions of things so cadmium, i use a cadmium yellow hue rather than a cadmium yellow um i i use artist quality rather than student quality so they i think they're pretty good it's like especially these days they've been they've worked been worked on so hard and tested so rigorously that then they're they're pretty good you're you're quite as long as you use them sensibly and you stick to the principle of fat over lean and 
um, then they're normally quite safe, I think, from an arc. I've, I've, throughout my, like every so often, I'll panic about things a bit and I'll, I'll ask a tutor, like an, a tutor from my university days, or I'll ask a conservation, uh, you know, a, a con conservator, a, a painting, um, someone who really knows what they about all the properties, and, and I'll ask and see if I'm doing the right thing. And um, yeah, but I think if you buy reasonable quality things, you should be okay as long as you treat them well. One thing I've learned though is to to um, it, the fat over lean thing where you're, you're using more oil in successive layers that only counts if you're going to let the, the layers dry if you're using yeah. if you're doing what i do in painting alla prima then you don't want to you don't want to put in too much medium because things dry at different speeds then it's, if it's all one layer not one layer but you know it's all wet at the same time if it dries at different times they'll be wrinkling so i i don't use too much medium i use a little bit of poppy seed oil um, I do. I used to use linseed oil. Poppy seed does a similar thing. It does slow the drying, but it just is a nice texture. Um, I think it's not as yellowing as I think that's the case. Um, but I only use it to improve flow, and I find I use it more in certain greens and ochre because they can be a bit drier. So it's it it's not to yeah it, it's not to do glazes or anything. I mean I think you can, but I don't use it for that. I use it just to just to improve the flow a little bit, but I try to keep it relatively similar. Thank you. Um, and yeah, can yeah, I have I one more question? question? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you said you paint on board, so you never taken a painting off the canvas and rolled it and send it in a tube? Actually, I have done that. Um, Scary. <laughs> I've done it once. Yeah, I once. Um, I used to stretch my own canvases and then I realised I didn't really like canvas and I'm not very good at doing it either. But I did, when I, I painted in, um, at the Cypress College of Art, I had to get all my paintings in a suitcase. And I think, I think I had to take them off the wooden boards and roll them up. Um, but because I'm painting on board, yeah, no, I don't have to do that. That actually, that's when you're varnish. I can't remember what the reason for varnishing work is now, because I never do it. But I think that probably helps if you're doing it on canvas. And I think the, the, um, the principle of fat over lean is especially important if you're doing it on a flexible surface like canvas because you want the layers to be safe if there's any movement but yeah doing it on board makes that a little bit safer i think but painting on aluminium is supposed to be the safest thing i've only done it a couple of times because it 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 feels like it shouldn't work it does work but it feels like it shouldn't but that's supposed to be really archivally good because you don't get all the acid from the environment or from the paint um and they don't warp so if you haven't tried them i would recommend trying them they're interesting i still find them a bit scary <laughs> thank you what do you mean just quick uh, i've got two more questions and i'm aware that we're like 10 minutes over but um what's fat over lean what does that mean like to someone who doesn't have a clue here fat oil right, right. over lean less fat so um lean would be the so if you're if you're painting in lots of if you, you know over many days and you're letting the layers dry and you're doing glazes you'd start off with um maybe diluting the paint with a little bit of turpentine or something i use zestic because it's not flammable and it's a bit more eco-friendly um but zest it or turpentine or whatever you're using you put a bit more of that in Th the thinner you'd put more of the thinner in and then maybe it depends how many layers but you'd have less of the thinner and then just paint and then paint with a bit of oil and then paint with more oil so that you have if you imagine if it's got oil in it's more flexible so i think the idea is that the flexible layers are on top um, and it's just more stable then it's less likely to crack mm. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about that. So I know a little more now. Um, which, so we've got two more questions. And I really don't mind if either of you don't want to say it out loud. But it's Judith, uh, Judith Westcott first. So I don't know if you want to unmute yourself. But I can ask a question if you don't want to say it. Hi, no. Uh, hi, Hester and everybody. Um, you've really answered the question that you are moving to, let's say, less realism. 
perhaps that's what you'd like to do is that right I, well I don't know it's I find that interesting because I think that if you really really economize on your brush marks they look abstract but I would say they're like not abstract they're still I'm still really sticking to being a, as objective as I can and as yeah um I I don't think I would move to Ne what what I necessarily call abstraction, although I'm aware that it does look like it, it's more. But you said you were going to you were using space and light. Now you were looking at a view or whatever yeah. and thinking, but... this is what I want now: space and light. And that surely is. But I think of it as <laughs> whatever label being you as, ob as objective and 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 as truthful and. Um, loyal to fate uh, to uh, color and light as i like as strictly loyal to them even if the detail goes um that like the form will still be there but just looser but the colors will be the colors and the tonal balance would be as accurate as possible and dictated by what's there rather than my impulses yeah i don't i guess i i kind of see abstraction as as making decisions that that come from you rather than from what you're painting or painting on so like the yes. opposite of mimesis the opposite of like you know figurative yeah but but i do know i do i, I kind of understand that if you go too far into that it does look abstract so i know that if i economize even if i'm being in my mind, as truthful and as loyal as possible, as mm. kind of high fidelity as possible, but I'm using bigger brush strokes to do it. It's a bit abstract. I guess the one thing I do do is like not play with the overall form so much, but try to use the paint to make, I don't know, shapes that are a bit more um, intuitive, a bit more. Yeah. So you would say you reacted emotionally to a lance. You know, it's so much the opposite. I have to think everything through so much. Yeah. Um, to a point where sometimes I think, why am I doing this? Um, <laughs> so I'm interested <laughs> in a much more intuitive and free response to what you're seeing. And it, it works very well. So congratulations. But... <laughs> And thank, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but thank you very much for a lovely evening. Thank you. I, I do thank find it interesting, coming. that question, though, because I always think I'm not that loose. I know the brush marks are loose, but I feel like I'm very, very strict and I don't use very much imagination. I feel like, right. like I, I lose the idea of imagination. It's got to be what's there. And there's not much emotion in it. And I hope that maybe some of those things come in afterwards, but... Um, I, I, I often think it's interesting because you see it, you see it like that, and other people say that as well. But I feel like I almost lack imagine. Well, I lack imagination. I'm just doing it as. Oh, perhaps the viewer always has to bring the imagination. Perhaps that's what makes the paintings so successful, because they allow us to bring our own experience or whatever. Sparse. Yeah, if they're sparse, there's gaps. Yeah, there, maybe they yeah. don't dictate anything. No, and I definitely used to do that a lot more, like with so social and environmental things. I was trying to make statements, and now I pointedly don't because that just made, that was too um, yeah. depressing. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't try to say anything. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Judith. Great questions. Great questions. Yeah, really good. And thank you for coming. We have one more question, and. Um, from Emily. Emily, do you want to talk or do you want me to talk for you? <laughs> Hi. Hi, Heather and Jeff. Thanks Hi. Um, my question was, um, what is it about painting landscapes that appeals to you the most and continues to excite you? Did you get that, Hester? Yeah. What, yeah. what is it uh, about landscapes that um, makes me want to paint? Um, I think there's there's a like well I I've I grew up in the countryside so I feel like I've got a connection to the landscape and um I know there are different landscapes I like painting urban landscapes as well but just I mean nature I think is the driving force nature the environment wildlife natural spaces um the just being outside um in in space in fresh air feeling like 
feeling like I have space, I guess, uh, that's sort of echoed in, in landscape. And I guess what the same thing that attracts me to being outside is the same thing that attracts me to landscape painting. And there's, I've, I've thought about this over the years and it's changed a bit. The answer will have changed over the years. So at one point it was I'm like, I'm making a, a record of it because it's changing or being threatened. And then at other points it would be, I am paying like homage to it. And then at other points, it would be like, um, well, I don't care. I just, I like it. I like looking at it and that's what I want to do. <laughs> and that actually served me quite well, I think. Um, like, I think on my MA, I was told to, you have to have a reason. You have to see yourself in the art world. You have to be able to justify things. And, um, and yeah, maybe you do to a certain extent, but actually it's quite freeing to just be like, I like this and I want to paint it. Don't, yeah, don't ask really me anymore. That's the sort of, and yeah, I think at the moment, I mean, like it's it's. I mean, I can be outside, but at the beginning of lockdown, when you could only have an hour out of your, you know, an hour's exercise, there was a connection with that. And when I lived in in the city, it was a connection with green spaces that I didn't have so readily available, and. I find now if people in cities buy my work or see my work, you know, a lot of people say they like it because it reminds them of what they don't have readily available. And I quite like that. I quite like that I can remind people of the natural world so that they maybe think about, think about it and maybe want to look after it a bit more. That's really great. Thank you. I'm just going to end it on um, something that I've just seen posted from Carolina. Like Grayson Perry said in one of his lectures, art doesn't have to be shocking. It can even be beautiful. So that's a nice way to end. Thanks, Carolina. That's really great. Well, thank you all so much for joining. I know we've gone over like 20 minutes, but it's it's just wonderful to have time to talk with Hester. And um, thank you so much. Now, this has been completely free. If you want to head to our next masterclass, which will be the third week next month, um, you can become a member. So uh, just head to my website, www.themakerseries.co.uk to our membership page and you can become a member. And you can even sponsor a youth member so that they can access um, these edited versions of these masterclasses. So it's all good stuff. Thank you again so much, Hester. You've been absolutely wonderful to listen to. And thank you all. <laughs>